Hi, before we take a look at what God wants to say to us today in His Word, we wanted to get you a free copy of our exclusive ebook, Healing is for You. This inspiring resource is designed to help you tap into the power of God's love and grace and to experience the healing He has for you. Text the word HEAL to 25252 or click on the link in the description below. Whether you've known Jesus for 40 years or for four minutes, we hope this message inspires you today. Rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. morning. And welcome church family. It always feels so good to be with you. You know, every single Christian has a calling and almost always, not just one calling, multiple callings at different times in their lives. So today know that you are called and so loved by God. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that you bring us peace fresh vision, new life. Lord, we all come here because we want to bring glory to your name. And we pray that we would leave here changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I.
In preparation for the message, Jeremiah 29, 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Amen. Thank you for being a part of our Hour of Power family. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. As we continue to recover from the effects of two very challenging years, now more than ever, it's important to take care of ourselves. When we embrace the act of self-care, we can live our best lives and love others really well. Caring for ourselves can be about our physical health, but it's also about slowing down, taking the time to pray, and seeing beauty in God's creation. There's wisdom and spirituality gained in these kinds of activities because they bring us closer to the heart of God. As a part of your self-care ritual, I believe adopting an attitude of gratitude will cultivate joy in your life. Practicing the art of appreciation has the power to transform our lives and our culture. Because Jesus redeemed our struggles and shortcomings, there are countless things to be thankful for. No matter how our circumstances look or how we feel, the Lord is a never-ending source of goodness, which means that we have plenty of blessings to count every day. To jumpstart your life of gratitude and happiness, we have a special offer for you this month. For your gift of just $25 or more, we'll send you our Faith Soap Dispenser. With the words, faith is not believing God can, it is knowing that He will, boldly displayed on the front. This clear glass dispenser holds eight ounces of soap, hand sanitizer, or lotion. For your gift of just $65 or more, you'll receive our self-care bundle, which includes the Faith Soap Dispenser, a Cast Your Cares candle, and a set of three gratitude journals. The candle, pleasantly scented sea salt and orchid, is made from soy wax, and the set of three gratitude journals includes 64 lined pages to record what you are grateful for. Call, write, or go online to request the Faith Soap Dispenser for your gift of $25 or more, or for your gift of $65 or more, we'll send you the complete self-care bundle. Hannah and I are truly grateful for you and your faithfulness in upholding Hour of Power. Your donations ensure that you and others will continue to be uplifted by our positive message for years to come. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we. Johnny Serpilla is the CEO of Encourage LLC, an entrepreneur and speaker who guides organizations on leadership development. In his new book, Life is Hard But I'll Be Okay, The Power of Hope Emerging Through Pain and Learning to Live with Gratitude, he documents the struggles he and his wife Susan have while raising a family. The book centers on how to have faith in the darkest of times. Please welcome Johnny Serpilla. Johnny, I thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, I love the title of your new book. Uh, it's a message we all need to hear. But before we jump into that, tell us a little bit about your faith journey. 
Well, good morning, everyone. And I have to say first, thank you for your choir. The song is the perfect intro. We're not walking alone. And that's exactly what my book is about. My faith journey has been solid, ongoing my entire life. I was raised in faith, and we really found that faith was needed when life got really hard for us as we were trying to build a family. Yeah. My book talks about the journey in our darkest times and how God helped us through those. So what was the dark time that you guys were going through, and how did God help you? My wife and I were committed to having a family, and that just wasn't happening. After years and years of trying, we became very pregnant with triplets, and God answered our prayers, and we had two sons and a daughter. Whoa. But unfortunately, Nicholas, Mary, and Peter all passed away um, shortly after they were born. And we were found, found ourselves in darkness and despair and infertile again without children um, and spending way too much time at a cemetery to try to be close to our kids. And what we really found over time was that our faith grew. We were never closer to Christ than we were in the time that they were alive. And we learned to rest and find gratitude in that time, as opposed to living with regret and sadness uh, for their death. It is amazing when we go through tough times. It's some people have one experience and some people have the other. It seems like some people really struggle with or even lose their faith while other people will grow in their faith, their trust in God, and their intimacy with others. But no, it seems like nobody ever just stays the same after a big event like that. What do you think the difference is? I think the difference is your, number one, your faith in God. I think your desire, and we fought hard to cling to each other. Mm -hmm. Knowing the statistics of couples that lose a child and what happens to their marriage, we did not want to be one of those fatalities. And we just knew God had goodness in store for our lives. We prayed for him, ultimately for God to send us the children that we were meant to raise and, and we're just live in gratitude for our time with Nicholas, Mary and Peter. You know, we always want more. We want more food, more love, more money, more relationships. And we had to learn to just be thankful for what we had. And those were ours for the five of us together. Yeah. And there was beauty in it. And God was right there with us. And then he blessed us through adoption and then amazing, difficult pregnancies um, that produced two more children. So we ended up with three children under the age of four. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. And that's what you mean by OK. It's even better than OK. But sometimes you just need to know when you're going through tough times that God will get you through it. And that's the title of your new book, Life is Hard, But I'll Be OK. Um, you have really practical advice, not just for people who have gone through a tough time, but I would say that any kind of leadership, building something, building a business and a ministry, building a, a nonprofit, building a family, anytime we're building or making, there's always going to be these really hard times we go through. And sometimes you feel like a lot of stress and pressure. Sometimes it's really nice to get a word from God or from a pastor or a mentor that says, you know, it's going to be okay. And not only okay, you're going to get to victory. Is this kind of where you're getting at with the title of your book? It is. It really is. And encourage, the name of my company is from Thessalonians 5.11. So encourage one another and lift each other up just as in fact you were doing. And when I read that verse and prayed on it, I thought, that's exactly what God has me doing, encouraging others. And as a leader, I call all leaders out there, whether it's in your home, in your business, in your church, in your volunteer work, where, wherever you are, there is an honor to lead. Yeah. And you really need to realize the impact that we have on each other, and not only each other in our workplace, but then also on the families of those that we interact with, because the energy we pour into people, positive or negative, they take home into their families. What uh, word of encouragement do you have for someone right now that is going through grief? There's a lot of heartache right now. People have lost others. There's some economic headwinds right now. What do you tell people when they're going through this period of, of winter? First of all, that we all go through that. And this book was written to really provide hope for people during their darkest days. 
and when life is really hard. And what I ask people to be mindful of is that there is beauty happening in the darkness. Hmm. You need to look for it. You need to be open to it, to receive God's hand that he is extending out through others around us. And he is there and he's serving us through others and other followers. And I ask you to just really look in those darkest times because for us, after the funeral, in the years that followed in therapy, where we just felt this dark cloud over us and we couldn't get out from under it. And even in the other challenges, and there's many more that, that followed, um, our youngest son is a uh, lucky baby number 13. So that was the 13th child that came uh, in and out of our lives um, in our journey to build a family. And so I ask you to look for the beauty in those darkest times and I promise you they are there. Somewhere they are there and that's through God's hand. I love it. Uh, Johnny Sparilla, thank you so much. Your book is called Life is Hard, But I'll Be Okay. I want to encourage people to get a copy of the book. It will inspire you, encourage you, especially if you're going through a tough time and whatever it is you're going through, God will carry you through. Thank you, Johnny. We appreciate you. God bless you. God bless you all as well. Thank you.
against you more than with my words or with the song. No, it's not been easy to live life down on my knees, but with faith I know I'll carry on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There is more to see than with my eyes, but fear sometimes can leave. fight would last so long in seasons of depression I plead for your protection make me right I'm tired of being wrong every time there's hope it seems to die I'm going to begin this morning by letting you on to a not-so-secret secret. Your life can change right now. You have before you a path, one that leads to life and one that leads to death. You can change your life today. It could be completely different. Are you at peace with God this morning? Maybe you're at peace with your neighbor. Maybe you're at peace at your job. But there's something on the inside you know, I'm not at peace with God. You can be there by trusting your life to Jesus Christ. Invite him into your heart and you'll never be the same. I want you to do that this morning. 
If you do that, text me the, num the word hope to the number on the screen. Well, today I want to talk specifically to anyone that feels like I'm here, but I don't want to be here. I want to be there. You ever feel that way? In your relationships, in your job, in your walk with God? Maybe it's literal. You want to get out of California or you want to get to California. A lot of that going on. You say, I don't want to be here. I want to be there. And I want to talk to that person. The first thing I would say is, if you are here and you want to be there, just go there. Go. Go there. But if you say, I can't go there, I'm stuck for whatever reason, this is the person I'm talking to today. You ever feel stuck before? I know I used to feel stuck in school. That was a stuck feeling. You know, you're eighth grade, 10th grade, you want to get out of there, you don't want to be there. Government babysitting service. The only one to get out was Ferris Bueller. But I'm not as smooth as him. Maybe you've been to prison or some of you are even watching on television in prison right now and you're stuck. And you're like, I don't want to be here, I want to be there. Maybe you're there wrongly. Yeah, I want to get out of here. Maybe you're in a job situation that for whatever reason, because of your family or, or whatever it is, you just can't, you're stuck in the job. Maybe you're a caretaker. Maybe you're stuck in bed. Maybe it's a, a health thing that won't go away. For whatever reason, you just sort of feel stuck in this place, but where you really want to be is over there. Here's the message from the Lord to you. Bloom first. Bear fruit first, right where you are. The message from the Lord this morning is bloom where you are, blossom where you are, flourish where you are. Remember, when Joseph was in prison uh, falsely, he must have been thinking to himself for all those years, rotting away in that dungeon, man, no good deed goes unpunished. But little did he know that he was in prison because God was preparing him to be the most powerful man in the country. The only way to be the king's right-hand man is first to be king's prison, if you're in Joseph's story. Israel wanted freedom from Egypt, but they had to become a new type of person in the wilderness, and that process took 40 years before they could inherit the promised land. When Saul was struck blind on his road to Damascus and scales covered his eyes, I'm not sure he knew he would ever see again. I think when you've been blind for a few days and can't see anything, you might wonder, will I be blind forever? I'm sure the thought crossed Saul's mind. But when the scales came off, he became Paul, the apostle to the Lord's church. There is no Saul turning into Paul unless there's a season of blindness. There is no Israel without a season of wilderness. There is no Joseph without a prison. And this is just the way life is. And it's one of the hard things about life when you're in those places. It feels like the end of the story, but very often you are in the middle. You are in a process. You are in a crucible. So here's what we get when we learn to blossom and flourish and bear fruit right where we are rather than where we want to be. Here's what we get. We understand that life gets better when we get better. We understand that life improves when we improve. We understand that everything we have is right here. It's the Lord. Because here's what we learn. You can grow anywhere the Lord is. You can flourish anywhere the Lord is. Everywhere the Lord is, is health, life, vision, fullness, abundance. And so much of bearing fruit right where you are is tapping into that life, that knowledge, and that resource. Every place we go offers more than one reward. No doubt every job you've ever had has had a salary, probably, or some kind of hourly payment. That's, we call that the first payment. But those same jobs also have people, lessons, experiences. We call that the second payment, a second reward. Every marriage, you get the reward of a wife or a husband, but there's also a second gift. You get the gift of becoming a spouse and all that that entails to becoming a different kind of person. It's interesting that every time a child is born for the first time, a father is made and a mother is made for the first time. Isn't that interesting? And so the first gift is the child, but everyone who's been a parent knows there's a second gift, 
and raising that child and changing poopy diapers and getting up in the middle of the night and worrying when she's out with the boy on a date or whatever. And all of these things actually are the second payment, the second reward, that if we ask God that they can turn us into something new. This is what blossoming right where you are teaches you is that it's not your situation that makes your life better. It's when you get better that life gets better. And every day you have a choice to give it all or give less than all. Every day you have a choice of who you'll spend time with. Every day you have a choice whether you're gonna waste life away or give everything you got. And you can do that in a prison. You can do that when you're sick. It's hard, I know, but I've done it. You can do it too. You can do that when you're lonely. You can do that when you're unemployed. Someone said, you can't do that when you're in prison. Well, from the Apostle Paul all the way to Dr. King, we know that some of the greatest moments of personal growth and flourishing happened in prisons. If you feel stuck, blossom where you are. Flourish where you are. Bear fruit right where you are. And you'll get that second payment. Maybe that second payment is something you'll learn. Maybe it's an opportunity. Maybe it's a person that you're supposed to meet. Or maybe it's a person you're supposed to help. It's not always about you. Sometimes you need to help somebody there. And once you help them, the door will open. And that brings us to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah chapter 29, 4 through 11. Before we get there, remember, God's plan for Israel and his people is to be a light in the darkness. And boy, was the world dark in the Bronze Age. Do you remember why God put Judah into exile in Babylon? Do you remember why? There was two big reasons that the scripture talks about over and over. Number one is because they turned their back on the poor, on the hungry, on the widow, that type of thing. We all sort of understand that, I think. I know nobody here goes, oh, that's, that's okay to do that. But then there's a second one that I always thought was a bit confusing, that they would bow down to idols. That's the second big one. And yes, very often we could talk about like the guy with the Ferrari as a, you know, has an idol or whatever like that. That's not what it was in, Jesus, or in, the, in the Jews' day, in the Bronze Age. The Canaanite gods did things like human sacrifice, including children. They had temple prostitutes who were oftentimes slaves. Today, today we consider that human trafficking. And there were so many other evil, horrible things that were done to innocent victims. And then here is Judah that's supposed to be the light to this world, but instead it is participating in it, participating in it, supporting it. And over time, God warns, stop, 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 till finally exile. And this is where we get that the, that the Babylonian exile, they conquer Judah, they take the Jews back to Babylonia, and Jeremiah is giving a word from the Lord to people who really messed up. And this shows the heart of God that it is full of grace, it is full of mercy, it is full of kindness, even to people who have really, really messed up. You say, I'm stuck because I messed up, there's grace for you, there's favor for you. You say, I'm, I'm in this mess because the decisions I made, there's grace for you. The door's gonna open for you. God's gonna break some burdens for you. And that's what brings us to Jeremiah 29, four. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty the God of Israel says to all of those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Why? This is, good. this is a great lesson, friends. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, that's what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Don't let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They're prophesying lies to you in my name. I've not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for, for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And this is God's plan for you, my friend. This is God's plan for you. You blossom where you are and then the door opens. 
got to remember, too, historically, this is where rabbinic Judaism forms, is in Babylonia, not in Israel. When the Jews come back from, from this place, this, they bring back with them synagogue and Torah teaching and all of the things that are foundation of, of Jesus' ministry and, and actually Christian life. A lot happens when you bloom where you're planted. You won't be there forever, though. God knows more about your tomorrows than we know about our yesterday. That's what Dr. Schuler said. What a great line. You can grow anywhere if the Lord is there. You say, I don't want to be here. I want to be there. Bloom where you are first. Here's seven ways you can bloom right where you are. Now, it has to be seven because it's a church, right? It's like a good Christian number. Maybe there's more. But these are just things that have worked for me, okay? So just take it with a grain of salt. And I get these from Scripture. Number one, just like a tree, grow as much as you can. As much as you can. Don't grow 70% as much as you can. Don't grow about half as much as you can. Give it all. You know why? You know why? Anyone who gives it all every day goes to bed saying, I'm glad I gave it all. I think there's something to that, to a happy life. Every single person needs progress in life. It is the truth. And very often we measure our life's progress on, am I married? How many children do I have? Or do I have good friends? Or have I started a business? Or have I accomplished this or accomplished that? Here's a better way to measure progress. Those things you can't control. A better way to measure progress is to look inside. Am I becoming a bigger person? Am I growing as a person? Am I growing in my skills? Am I becoming a better leader? Do I understand the ways of the world better than I did six months ago? Am I getting healthier? And these are ways, if you're making progress here, the other stuff on the outside, it'll take care of itself. So here's what you take care of. Like a tree, a tree that grows a lot, a lot that gets big is a tree that has, well, nutrition. It's a tree, a tree that grows a lot, has deeper roots. A tree that grows a lot is one that endures pruning. You ever seen a tree that's been pruned? It doesn't look good. It looks dead. I imagine if I was a tree and I got pruned, I would say, stop. Stop. What are you doing? Stop. Satan's attacking me. But in this rare case, it'd be the hand of the Lord. Maybe it's not happening to you, it's happening for you. A tree that grows needs sunshine, but not all the time. Not all the time. We call those cactuses or cacti. Both are correct. I asked an English teacher. And trees need rain. But not all the time, not all the time, being gloomy all the time, gray skies all the time. No, it needs a little bit of both, and it needs to grow as much as it can. You see, every single human being, unlike a tree, gets to choose if they want to grow as much as they can. Here's a choice you have. You can become all that you were meant to be, or you can become less than you were meant to be. And every day you make that decision. So which one will it be? Choose all. Become all, all that you can be for the Lord. Number two, if you want to bloom where you're planted, don't curse what you have. How common this is in an age of envy and comparison and popularity. Jesus tells a parable about weeds that are sown in a master's farm. These great, beautiful crops are growing up, but in the middle of the night, a competitor comes and plants a bunch of weeds, and so these weeds start growing up with the beautiful crops. And his servants say, Lord, we got to pull up those, those weeds. And what does he say to them? Don't do that. Why? You pull up the weeds, you pull up the corn. you got to let it all grow, and we'll sort it out in the end. Man says, this field has corn, but it's got weeds too. Burn it down. Burn it, get rid of the whole, I hate this field. Burn it down. No, no. Sometimes the crops have to grow with the weeds. Don't curse what you have. So many people hate their body, hate their age, 
They don't really like their friends or their job or they complain about their family or especially they hate their country or their city or their state or their university or their church. There's weeds that grow in every farm. Sometimes they just grow together. They just grow together. Don't curse what you have. Bless the soil. Bless the seed. Bless the rain. Bless the sun. It's all you have. Use what you have and make the best of it. Number three, learn how things are. Not how they should be. Not how you want them to be. Not how it would be fair if. Stop using the word should as much as possible. You got to learn how they really are. Jesus is teaching to a famous, uh, talking to a famous teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, and is telling him about the spiritual life and telling him how to be reborn of the spirit and how the spirit dwells in a person. And Israel's teacher was, he was so confused. He said, what, what? And he said, I don't understand. And Jesus says to him, you're Israel's teacher? Let me tell you, a lot of your professors in school, some of your parents, some of the people you know, that act like experts really aren't experts, especially if they were, use the word should a lot. Learn how things really are. You need more money? Learn how money really works. You want a spouse? Learn to become an attractive person. And when I say attractive, I don't mean just physically attractive. I mean, here's a perfect example. I, I have to be careful. I don't know if my friend watches the show, but I had a friend from college who had a lot of baggage and a lot of issues. And he wasn't a bad looking guy, but he had a list of all the things he wanted his wife to be. And it was insane. It looked like basically a rocket scientist supermodel millionaire. And, and all of us were looking at him, we're all friends, we're like, you need to work on your list. Here's, here's, it, it sounds so much meaner as I'm saying it out loud. You know, it sounds so rough, but this guy is my friend. Here's what has to happen. You want to attract somebody in your life, you need to become the kind of person that someone says, I'd love to marry that kind of person, see? We always think about who we want to get, not about who we want to be for whoever it is we marry. And that's true if you're still married. What a great goal it would be. You think your spouse would like it if your number one goal this year was to become the greatest spouse ever? Think it'd be good for your marriage? Think you'd be a happier person? It's worth thinking about. Well, anyway, I'm going too long on this. Learn how things are and deal with reality. Okay, number four, don't waste your life. It's never been easier to waste your life than it is today. About 100 years ago, there was this thing people used to experience called boredom. I remember my grandma, she grew up on a farm, and I said, oh, it must have been amazing growing up on a farm. She said, no, a farm is boring. And that's the thing about boring places, is boredom is an incubator for creativity, for sonnets, for paintings, for books. When you're bored, you start staring off into a beautiful place and you start cooking up things that wouldn't happen if you had, say, Instagram or YouTube or Netflix or football or TV. Look, I like all these things and I enjoy them all the time, but like any good thing, you can overdo it. And boy, has it become so easy. Boredom is something that happens now within seconds, not within hours like it used to be. It's literally like you sit anywhere for about 15 seconds and most people today choose to waste their life away. This is what the rich young ruler was about. Rich young ruler had all the stuff in the world. And Jesus, he comes to Jesus and Jesus says, I want you to follow me. I want you to become my disciple. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to give your stuff away to the poor and follow me. Now, God, he doesn't ask all rich people to do that. Some rich people get to keep it. But what was the problem with this guy? He lacked generosity. This young man, do you understand what Jesus was asking him? I mean, do you understand what Jesus was asking him to do? How many disciples are there? Just 12, right? 12. The super Christians in here can name all 12, 12 of them, right? These are, these are people that all have saint in front of their names. They've got churches named after them. Long after I'm gone, people remember all that they did and all that they said. You understand, he was inviting this rich young ruler to be, become one of those 12 guys. We would know his name. 
But instead, we just know him as the guy who wasted his life away because he refused to be stingy instead of generous. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Use your free time to get the life you want rather than escape the life you have. You see, I don't have any time. If you sleep eight hours, that's, and you work eight hours, you got another eight hours. Eight hours, what do you do with it? Use one of those hours to become the person you were called to be, to do the in, inner work. All right. Hannah told me, be more joyful in your sermon. You seemed grumpy. So I'm going to try and cheer up. I'm trying working hard. <laughs> okay. Number five. <laughs> Number five. See opportunity when everybody else sees calamity. This is a gift. This is a great way to flourish and bear fruit wherever you're planted. People say to Gideon, the Midianites have 132,000 men in their army and they're coming to destroy our nation. And Gideon says, no problem, I've got 300. They say, Gideon, you need less soldiers. This is a calamity. This is a catastrophe. He says, no, I don't. 300 will do. 300 will get the job done. How will three? I got an idea. And one night, when 132,000 men who don't know each other, do you know, if you were, anybody go to a big university with like 60,000 people, like USC or something like that? It's a little country. You don't know everybody's name. You don't know who's who. You got a Midianite army with slaves and people from all sorts of countries speaking different languages. That's not a catastrophe, that's an opportunity. These 300 guys, they surround that army, create a bunch of fire and noise, and this army just kills itself and retreats. Where everybody else saw calamity, the Lord sees and instructs Gideon, it's probably a better way of saying it, opportunity, an opportunity for victory by the Lord's hand. When's the best time to start a business? Now, most people in business will say when the market's going up, when that industry is going up. But maybe the best time to start a business is when that market's going down. If you can create a business when a market is going down, then in a business cycle when things turn around and go up, your business will explode. If you build a business when it's going up, and you do really well, everybody's, they, the old saying, everybody's a genius in an up market, everybody's a great investor in an up market, right? How many of you own Bitcoin? That's a, that's a bridge too far, isn't it? That burns a bit. Okay, so, okay. You build your business going up, and then it goes down, you go down with everybody else. When's the best time to start a church? When people are growing in faith or leaving in faith? Leaving. Okay. So, see opportunity when everybody sees calamity. Number six, get the right people around you. This is so important. We human beings just can't help ourselves. We become like the people we hang out with. We can, just cannot, it is just the weirdest thing. There's been a million studies on this. We cannot help ourselves. You know, the number one reason why addicts who get clean and sober, and are clean and sober for years, the number one reason addicts relapse, you know what it is? They start hanging around their old friends. Knew a guy, clean and sober for 10 years, moved back home, the first night he was home, out with his friends, and OD'd and died. That's, what, that's how it happens. We just love, we, we hate being alone. We love people, and people affect us. They affect the way we think. They affect what we want. They affect how we see the world. Studies showed Recently, that when you take somebody who's not a big performer in a sports team or in an organization, you put them with someone who's a performer, their performance goes up 30%. So here's something to think about. Join a group where your desired behavior is the norm. Join a group where your desired behavior is the norm, and it'll just happen. Somebody here says, Bobby, Jesus tells us to love the prostitute and the tax collector and the outsider and to... 100%. Absolutely, we do that. But when you see Jesus, there is a circle and then there's an inner circle. Jesus loves everyone, invites everyone. His disciples invite everyone. But the 12 are special. 
The 12 are special. It is important. Okay, so it's both. Number seven, last one. It's church, right? We've got to have seven things. Take action. Get serious. Get serious. Take action. There is this thing called the knowing-doing gap that happens in the West a lot. You study, you study, you study, and you feel like you've achieved something. And you do nothing. Well, the studying, I achieved something. Study. Yeah, but you loaded the gun, but you didn't fire the shot. Take action. Get serious. I am a joyful person. I'm a laughing person. I have fun. I've instructed in this church to never trust a religious person who can't laugh at a joke. But life is not silly. Life is serious. Life is serious. Don't waste your life. Get serious. It's not, we call it life and death. Life and death. Those are your choices. Life or death. Get serious about it. I heard someone say once that life is the constant, uh, the constant holding back of death trying to take over. can feel that way sometimes. And I think there is something like that in our culture today. It's like a fog. It's like a fog that's always trying to take you. Don't give in to it. Get serious. Take action. Now, take action. Do something that takes what you want and connects it to something you're doing. Buy the book. Find the friend. Join the church. Make the call. Write the letter. Open the Word doc. Whatever it is. Go to the empty painting. Begin the thing. Begin it. Do something. If you do these things and more and you trust your life to the Lord and you commit your life to the knowledge that He's given you and you refuse to give in or give up, you will begin to bear fruit right where you're planted no matter where you are. And not a little bit of fruit. It's a lot of fruit. You will see that you always had all that you needed in the Lord right where you are. You didn't need a new place, a new spouse, a new country, a new state. You needed all that you already had. And then you'll start bearing incredible fruit, an abundant fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. And then guess what happens? The door opens. The door will open for you if you blossom and bear fruit right where you are. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. This is the day you've made. We will rejoice and be glad of it. We pray, Father, to give us all that we need to bear fruit. I especially pray right now for healing over those who are sick. And I ask in Jesus' name that the spirit of sickness will be broken right now. And in fact, if you want that in this moment, open your heart and simply say to yourself, I believe and I receive healing. And so we ask for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're excited to announce that very soon we're going to be going to the Holy Land and we want to invite you to go with us. Have you ever wanted to see a place like this, Capernaum, the city that was the headquarter for Jesus' ministry? Nearby, Bethesda, Chorazan, the Sea of Galilee. Maybe visit the Jordan River or even be baptized there. Visit Jerusalem, see the Temple Mount, see the place where Jesus was raised from the dead. I want to invite you to come with us to the Holy Land. Thank you for watching. We hope this message inspired you and brought you closer to Jesus. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We believe that Christ's healing power is available to all of us and that through prayer and faith, we can experience the miraculous spiritual healing that he made possible when he went to the cross.
If you're trusting the Lord for restored health in your life or need encouragement to believe that biblical healing is for you, we want you to have our ebook, Healing is for You, God's Healing Power. To get your free gift, text the word HEAL to 25252 or click the link in the description below. Remember as always, God loves you and so do we.